already his second book is going to come out this August. He's working on that. Why he also maintains all his public interactions wherever people invite him. So he is uh, in that sense uh, chooses his battleground and sharpens his skills and focuses on that and delivers. So we have invited him here today because all of us have uh, also some thoughts on what is our identity, what does our culture mean to us, right? Is it even relevant in a global village that we are all in? Right? So uh, on those questions which we face on a daily basis, uh, I would request Sai to come share his thoughts and also have a candid conversation with all of you. Welcome, Sai.
memory is a it's an extremely powerful and effective weapon. I'm not asking you to learn stuff by rote, but do not discount memory. So my entire uh, style of learning has been that once you see something and once you look at it, you should try and remember it as much as possible. So as a lawyer, we survive on memory to a significant extent. Each day, if you have 10 to 15 cases, you can't remember everything in detail, but you have to pick the best of those points. And with time, what happens is you will know which side of the page it is, on which, whether it's on the top or the bottom, is it on the left or the right, what was the page number, and you get imprinted. Most people actually think that memory is uh, a genetic gift. It is not. It's actually like a muscle. If the more you try and trust your own memory, the more it rewards. It's not as if some people are born with great memory, they may be, but it's not as if it's difficult for those who, who are not to actually catch up with them. With time, I think anybody can do everything. So what I've tried to do over the years is pack my day with as much productive work as possible. Uh, as Shobit said, there's one thing that I learned from my family. No matter what you do, there's no point in being an also ran, which is to say, I do participate. I don't want a certificate of participation in anything. If you're there, you might at least achieve something in your own case. So the idea is, if you take up something, exit at it to such an extent that you're able to speak on a particular subject without any kind of support. No PPTs ever, no notes ever, nothing. And I don't rehearse before I talk. You constantly read so you have enough material to talk about. So I hope that answers your question. Next. I hope the answer is that hasn't scared them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. So how self-discipline plays a crucial role in the journey of life? See, I wish I actually uh, had my kind of discipline now at your age. Yeah, like Simply because I think these are fantastic periods of your life which obviously will never come back. That's, that's saying something that is downright obvious. But most importantly, the pressures that you have once you enter this phase, you don't have now, which allows you to read as much as possible. So, I don't think you should end up making this phase of your life dull and boring. Shouldn't be the case. But you should not also assume that learning is boring. So that you have to find ways of making it interesting. And I think to a significant extent, it, it is also a function of the kind of friends you choose, the kind of people you surround yourself with. So I think discipline happens largely through your own motivation, but also you see a, from you you look at others and you learn. So I'll give you a simple example, and Shobit can relate to this. So if you go to if you're a product of IIT, IIT is not great because of the faculty. The faculty is just like any other. Place. You know what makes IIT different? So the people, it's the students, because you effectively end up getting at least let's say, a cross-section of the cream of the society. And everybody is driven. So you learn less from, let's say, the faculty or anybody else, but you see all your friends being all-rounders, or they are geeks or nerds of some kind who, who know what they're talking about. So not just in engineering, some might be fantastic when it comes to something else altogether. But if you go to IIT, you see them participating in dramatic society, athletics, and whatnot. It's a crazy place there. You're, the only way you can survive in such a place, in fact, there are two ways. Either you get bogged down by the kind of talent you see around, and you move into a shell, or you say it's a fantastic place. I might as well make all my mistakes here and come out on the right side. And then you jump into that, and you try and push yourself. So IIT may be a slightly extreme example, because that's at a later stage. But the choice that is given to you, I think, in, in the initial years, is the kind of people you wish to be associated with. 
I have learned so much from my friends that even when it comes to law, I will give my friends more credit than the faculty that have been guided by me and taught by me. There's one good reason. You may have a particular thought. Your friends may not agree with you. But since they are your friends, they're open to debate. So think of them as the whetstone that sharpens the sword. You constantly argue with them, debate with them. It brings out the best in you. That's been my experience. So one, I think, is your own choices. But most importantly, the kind of people you surround yourself with who motivate you to do something different and better. That may work. Thank you. Yes, please. No, I wasn't. I would be an average student. So I'll tell you what I backed up. Mm, I was the typical last venture. So when I finished my 12th, I was 16. Because my parents had admitted me in school a year early. Those years, that's what they used to do. And I struggled in school because my peers were at least one year senior to me. And in the young age, the rate of growth of the brain is really fast. So you actually can see a difference between your colleagues and you, even if there is a one year difference, or even if there's, if there's an eight month difference. I struggled with science, I struggled with mathematics. But those subjects that required fantastic memory, I was really good at. So every other subject I used to be great, but science and mathematics, I really sucked. So how many people are here from Telangana? Anyone from Telangana at all? Okay, okay. <laughs> so when it was undivided Andhra Pradesh, like you have boards for the 10th and the 12th, we had boards for the 7th. So my parents, their biggest fear was, will he flunk mathematics in 7th? Then what happens? How will he go to the 8th? So against my will, and with all the embarrassment that goes with taking up tuitions, I was pushed into a mathematics tuition. That man was not a great teacher. But the one thing that he did was, in my school, I once asked a, a doubt of my teacher in sixth standard. She thought that I was testing her, but in fact, I had trouble understanding. So she said, how dare you ask me a question? I'm a postgraduate in mathematics. How can you ask me a question? I said, I am not understanding the point. I'm not questioning your, that I don't understand it. So after that, I stopped asking questions because the teacher was not receptive to it. But this man, his only contribution was, he said, from step one to step two, don't proceed if you don't understand. You will not proceed to step two until you understand step one. And I don't mind if you keep asking me questions, but until you know what you're doing, don't go to the step, second step. According to me, he completely reoriented my wiring completely. I, I think after that, that's been my template. If the first question is not answered to my satisfaction, you may be a genius, I don't care, I will not go to the second step. So fortunately, after that, the fear of mathematics was gone, and the love of logic began. So gradually I did okay. I was still not a topper. I would be somewhere in the fifth or the sixth position, whatever it is. I was just perhaps at best in the sixth or seventh position. And you would always, in, and I don't know how many people are aware of this, at least in southern families, the first question they ask is, how much did your friend get? <laughs> how is he doing better than you? So you like your friends. But you also hate them to the core. <laughs> because they are the benchmarks of comparison for whatever in life. So uh, I don't think, uh, so it's good to have benchmarks among friends. But I think you should also first judge yourself on how are you doing better compared to how you were. That's the first frame of reference. Because if you constantly look at others, you don't come from the same circumstances. You don't come from the same background. So it's very difficult to say that this journey is the same as that journey. So I think you ultimately gradually cope to look at yourself individually. So to answer your question, uh, Steve Jobs was a backbencher. Okay? Backbenchers have a fantastic quality. We sleep. 
But when the questions are asked, we are the first ones to wake up. And we develop the ability to listen as we speak. Because we don't want to be caught unaware when the teacher meets you up. We end up asking the right question. The point I'm trying to make is that every position in life teaches you some skill. And backbenchers are extremely sweet spot because they have to survive if they don't have academic abilities. <coughs> with time, if, you, if you're blessed with academic abilities, that's a different issue. But you should have some skill. That's what sitting on the bank bench taught me. And we have a fantastic sense of humor. Because we're constantly poking fun at everybody else in the class. <laughs> so if, if I were to ever go to a public function, now I can't do that much. But in weddings and other places, my brother and I would be found sitting at the back, taking fun of everybody across the place. He's like, this, just for the heck of it. But the point I'm trying to make is, uh, maybe you don't, you take yourself seriously, but you also don't take yourself too seriously. Because if you don't do that, this phase of your life you will remember as a phase of constant struggle. We are just fighting, competing, so on and so forth. Fortunately, I think I was saved that to a significant extent. By the way, I was so bad in science that in the sixth standard, my teacher specifically said, unless he kneels outside the classroom, I will not teach science for the entire year. So for an entire year, I was kneeling outside the classroom. <laughs> my parents didn't know this because I couldn't go and tell them. It was too embarrassing. I revealed this, I confessed to this only a few years ago to my parents. So it, it was partially dramatic, but at the end of the day, I think it teaches you uh, to deal with each of these situations. There are two ways I could have responded to that. One, never touch science at all after that, and off for humanities or whatnot. Thanks to that tuition teacher, I aspired for IIT, almost cleared it. I think I was a fairly decent engineer before I made the switch to law. I wanted to become an aerospace engineer. So what you are, perhaps in school, is no reflection of what you can be later. Any number of stories in my friend circle I've seen. Toppers being average people after school, and absolute legards coming out like, how do I put it, bursting forth after school. So I, I don't think any particular phase can decide what you will be in the future. Next. Yes, please. As you are an engineer, turned into a litigator, so how did that happen and how did it went for you? So, uh, it actually relates to the theme of this fest. I was uh, preparing for a master's in aerospace engineering when I was in uh, undergraduate. Because my cutoff for aerospace engineering was not enough, so I had to settle for mechanical engineering. So as they say in our parlance, mechanical engineering is like rice. You can mix it with anything. <laughs> so the hope was that you finish your undergraduation in mechanical, prepare for a master's. So there are two places I'd applied for. One was IIT Kanpur and the other was Georgia Tech, which has a fantastic aerospace program. Uh, everything was done, all set. Somewhere around the sixth semester, I had gone to uh, IIT Kharagpur for a technical paper presentation you have to do, which is your final <coughs> semester projects, you have to present it and prove that uh, it has been validated by someone. I was constantly reading upon politics, culture, and everything under the sun. It just so happened that, uh, I hope it's not too sensitive to say this here, issues like caste would create a lot of fights between friends. And I wanted to understand why was this happening. And uh, around that time is when uh, quite a few things happened. The BJP lost in 2004. The India Shining Campaign completely flopped. BJP lost in the center, and you would see that reflecting on campuses. People would fight about it. And since I come from a background where I'm extremely proud of the Hindu identity, that would be targeted. So I wanted to understand, in a Hindu majority country, why are Hindus targeting Hindus? It didn't make sense to me. 
I can still understand if somebody else who is not a Hindu has a problem with my identity. But why do Hindus have such hatred of their own identity was the question. So obviously when you're preparing for engineering and masters in engineering, you don't have any answers to this because you're not trained in the subject. The history that you know is only the history taught in school. Beyond that, you have no idea. So fortunately, a few friends and their relatives gave me good books to read. I hope someday you get to read the Arun Shori. Forget everything else, just read his books at the very least. And at that point, I effectively asked myself, do you want to comment on social media about these issues? Or do you want to be in a position where you can contribute to it? where you actually have some ability to speak on it intelligently and maybe hopefully change the discourse. So there are two options. In IIT there is a fad, everybody prepares for UPS. At least 30% of the crowd is preparing for civil services. So I was fairly confident of hearing perhaps at least stage one but then I'm so outspoken that I will not survive in the bureaucracy even one day. So for a person with a fairly big mouth, I think law is a better profession. Because it arms you with information, and you also get paid to fight it. It couldn't be better. It couldn't have been better for me. And uh, if you're fundamentally argumentative, and you also uh, have perhaps a decent gift of gap and you're not satisfied reading only one particular subject and you want to read across the board. Law is literally the shangri-la for such people. Because you're expected to read upon economics, political science, history, constitution, logic, reasoning, your ability to come up with the right term of phrase for a particular situation, language, etymology, everything is thrown there. So most people assume that if you if you become a lawyer, I'm not trying to recruit you to my profession, but I'm just telling you why I think uh, I'm okay with it because I really love the, the profession. I thank God, or the gods for that matter, each day for having pushed me in this particular direction because the day I set foot in law school, it was literally as if Atma had entered the city. <laughs> oh, this is my home. This is where I belong. I was absolutely sure of it. No matter what the outcome of the journey, I would have certainly enjoyed the journey completely. And uh, uh, I regretted not having chosen economics or humanities and everything else in my twelfth. But there's nothing I could have done about it because I come from a family of engineers and that to only mechanical engineers. They have not produced anything else under the sun. <laughs> only mechanical engineers. And I wonder why. Everybody is a mechanical engineer. So for such a family, uh, for me to make a switch to law, I had to convince <coughs> them. I had, literally, I had to have round table conferences at home. Because they said you were preparing for aerospace engineering. What happened? So those days we had phones that looked like small bricks, the Nokia double three double three. Keypad. Sorry. Keypad. Achha, right. Oh, keypad. Correct. And when I when I fell asleep, my mother used to check the phone just to see if I was corresponding with friends on sale and purchase of drugs. <laughs> they actually thought I was on to something. They never had that reputation before. I mean, they never had this impression of me before. And for the first time in my life, I was accused of uh, smoking something. So <laughs> I had to tell them, there's no such thing. This is the place I want to be. I've made this choice. This is where I think I will do really well. So I've told this before. So like sometimes India listens to United States. Indian relatives listen to US relatives. <laughs> so my uncle called and said, he's doing the right thing. America is a great combination of engineering and law. Tathastu. <laughs> that was the end of the discussion for Indian family. America said, the green signal are here. So I said, I was telling this thing for six weeks. You need one phone call from the US. But even then, uh, their entire concern was, what will you do after law? So the impression of lawyers in my family was, and significantly remains in certain unlettered sections of the family, is 
we are people who ride hercules cycle uh, asking for cases with mismatched flip flops we are not even called ambulance chasers in a much more sophisticated fashion like in the US. It's even worse here. So there is a bridge in Hyderabad, it's called the Chikatpali Bridge, which is where you find touts and lots of everything under the sun. So they said, will you be standing here asking for cases? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to hold files of your senior and run from one place to another? You can be an engineer, you can sit in an office, AC office, right? AC office. <laughs> So I had to say it's okay, whatever the struggle I do it. But uh, this was <coughs> in two thousands when by which time national law schools were fairly well known, which are the equivalents of the IITs for the legal profession. And still this was the case. Imagine how backward my family was in terms of its exposure. Not to blame them. We come from a lower middle class background, so it was very difficult to think of anything outside of engineering or medicine. These were the only two options. Not because we wanted to do engineering or medicine, but because the benchmark is return on investment. And two, matrimonial prospects. <laughs> Straightforward question. And your ability to tell your cousins, no, no, he's doing this, he's in this company. So you, all these three factors have to be satisfied. Law satisfied, none of them. If you're a lawyer, the first assumption is engineering name mila hoga. Doctor nahi ki hoki, CA to bilkul nahi. So CA was even at the bottom of the list. If you can't do even that, <laughs> then art student and law students were the same. <laughs> which is, Bekar, manufacturing defects, defective pieces, broken products, and rowdies of the first order. Lawyers means rowdies, that's what they assume. So I had to suffer that for at least a good four to five years because they said aerospace can be all the art market. See that. Went on for a while. And uh, now I think they know what I'm doing. Uh, but most importantly, I think the point I'm trying to make is certainly listen to your parents. I'm not asking you to go against their grade. But I hope when you take a decision, you ultimately take responsibility for it, no matter what the decision. If you want independence, independence comes with responsibility and accountability, period. After having taken the decision, I did not have the benefit or let's say the luxury of telling my parents, why did you stop me at that time? No. If you're adamant about making the choice, then pay the price for it one way or the other. Uh, by the time I made the choice, I was 20, so for all practical purposes, I was at least not a minor in any sense, legally speaking. So after the, the responsibility for the decision falls on your head. That's it. So that's the answer. Next. Yes. So I have a very classic question we have for all this question. Yes, sir. Do you know the parents in this Right. What it means to be indic? So what it means to be indic? Let's answer it at their level. Sir, yes. Just adding to the same question. Uh, uh, I was also wondering that uh, when you would come and uh, your one famous argument that I use at places is that you may not be uh, uh, you may not be needing your Hindu identity, but there are people who who Seriously. are who are worried about your Hindi Hindu identity, and they will use it. So how come people at this stage, children at this stage, uh, can we somehow? Uh, at, at, at their level, can be made aware about this. See, at their level, it makes very little sense to expose them to confrontationist issues. I don't think their entry into culture should be tainted with negativity. You start with certain fairly positive aspects. And I don't know how many people read this interview of uh, Pragyananda where the question that he was asked by this interviewer was, why do you wear the sticker? His answer was, my mother asked me to wear it, that's it. Mm -hmm. Straightforward answer. He didn't try and give, saying that if I apply this, the third eye opens, and then I can see better. <laughs> he said nothing about that. He simply said, my mother asked me to wear it. So to me, I think, to some extent, maybe parents can take some role there. Because uh, schools have their own 
pressures. 40 students or 30 students to be reined in by one person, impossible. And then you think that person will impart education, culture, responsibility, everything else. What do you think of the teacher? Superman. So that's what they have to do. Why would they teach at the salaries that they get today in this uh, day and age, especially when the private sector is open? I'm a son of a teacher, so I know what happens. <laughs> so, considering that, I think what does Indic mean at this age? Ideally, sabke maathe pe tika hona chahiye tha. That's my first answer. I don't step out with a, without a tika. It doesn't matter where I'm going. Two, not because I have to rub my identity in someone's face, but because this is who I am. And two, whether it's a court, whether it is any place, it doesn't make a difference to me. I'm not ashamed of it even one bit. In fact, if you come to the Supreme Court, from Shrikhas to Tika, you'll find everything on the sun in abundance. Everything. People sport their identity is very proudly. It doesn't matter which religion you come from. I think what it means is a sense of belonging. And it teaches you that you come from a certain cultural background. Automatically there are certain I don't think the purpose of culture is to divide people. The purpose of culture is to put a filter in your head. Particularly when you try and take a decision. Are you taking the right decision or the wrong decision? Because your parents are not going to be around to help you all the time take a decision. You have to take a decision at some point. So through culture and the upbringing that you have, you develop a moral filter. The young crowd, I don't want to say anything. You know what is happening in our city, Hyderabad now. And that's not a crowd which is over 80. Unfortunately, so. I think that's a clear lack of upbringing, clear lack of cultural work. The very same age group. I don't know if we can protect everyone everywhere. You can't have a policeman for every child and every child. It's not possible. <laughs> so I think the purpose of culture, fortunately as a lawyer, I don't need electricity to multiply the effect of my voice. <laughs> I don't think culture should be introduced to them in a negative fashion at all because they should put them off. Given what they have to deal with in schools and other places, give them positive examples. Maybe show good role. So the first thing I think as Hindu students, you end up having a problem with is you have to deal with questions such as caste and whatnot. And second, as a society, have you contributed to technology, science, and everything? Because every day when they use these gadgets, the first question that's going to come to their mind is the West has produced this. Where is my society's contribution to this? And given the curriculum, whether it's mathematics or whatnot, I'm sure they're bound to hear about Leibniz and Fourier transformations and whatnot, but they will not hear of a single name which is Hindu in nature. That's bound to create a lot of inferiority complex in their head. So maybe parents can take an interest. In fact, that question is best posed to parents as opposed to children. Uh, I pity them in one sense. They have been thrown to the wolves with too many distractions and not too much to hold on to. And in the process, what happens is you can't blame them for what they consume after that. You have to give them the phone just for the sake of their safety. But the phone is also an entry point into a lot of portals, which are not exactly safe. It's a catch What can you do? I, on this, uh, is it uh, teachers have too much at Parents, you know, we have nuclear families, yeah. both working. They are too early, but have been thrown to the wolves. Right. So, what is the way out? I mean, uh, someone has to take that step. I mean, uh, community not there anymore. Migration, you know about that. So, are we just passing the buck? Because everyone thinks it's not mine. Parent could say the school should do it. The school, the parent could do it. Right. The parent, could, the community should do it. Community never takes it. So, where is it? What would be the way to 
I'm going to give an extremely boring answer for this crowd. <laughs> if I've not done that already. Um, I don't think any one party can pull the weight on its own. Somewhere, I think all of us have to come together, provided we think it's important enough. Frankly speaking, I think uh, nuclear companies is not the problem. I'm a product of a, maybe a giant company in the first few years, but after largely nuclear. And both parents worked until recently because they wanted to. But they took, a, how do I put it, an extremely serious test, not just in the qualifications of the degrees that they wanted us to come up with, but also specifically what kind of people we turn out. I'll give you one simple example. You go to the airport in T3, half the time, the idiot who's rude to the air hostess or the person on the other side of the counter is a young, spoiled brat. Young, spoiled brat. And he's not even being stopped by his parents when he's being rude to someone else. They let him get away with it. They think of it as a sign of entitlement and sophistication that their son is capable of being rude to another person. Forget the corporal punishment. There's not even a tongue lash in here. Had I done that with anyone in my younger years, I'd be properly disowned in front of everyone. Horrible behavior, horrendous behavior, the sense of entitlement. Pardon me for saying so, but I think we're producing a lot of laddus and papus. <laughs> I say this physically and mentally. Obesity is on the rise. You can see this very clearly. Heavily on the rise. The gorging on the kind of nonsense that they get access to, coupled with that, see, if you, to a significant extent, your eating habits also reflect your sense of estate and what is it that you think you want to and you can't. And the kind of behavior that you get en encouraged uh, from in, in terms of the family, unbelievable, especially in public places. So, how do you not blame the parents there to some extent? Culture, all that is second thing. You can't teach your children to be decent people. Something fundamentally wrong there. No? So in that sense, I think this is a great place. Maybe we start with basic public behavior, basic etiquette, and then think of culture. Or we use culture as, let's say, a reference point to tell them the value of each of these things. Uh, since it's, a, it's not exactly an adult crowd, one shocking example. Yesterday I was completely uh, put off. Uh, I'm a huge animal lover. I have three dogs. Three of them, one's called Laddu, the other's called Leela, the other's called Laya. All of them strays. And uh, the hope is that we start uh, a rescue soon. I have the resources, I can do it. I just want to be able to do that for the simple reason that uh, I think. The test of this generation is youngsters are being cruel to animals, stray animals. Terrible. It's a, it's a dangerous sign as to what is going to happen in the future. And hopefully, we turn the rescue shelter also into a place where children can come and play with animals and learn kindness to some extent. We have to come together as a community. There's no other option. No one single entity can bear this responsibility. It's too fractured and it's too, uh, how do I put it, discreet, R-E-T -E as opposed to R-E-T, -E broken up. So maybe we have to find ways, because this is not a luxury question, this is an immediate question. We are investing not in the present, we are seriously investing in the future. So the future is young. I hope it's safe. Next. Sir, it's today it's also the environment day. Looking at environment as a god and look, uh, how does looking at environment as a mother and god as opposed to looking at environment as beauty make a difference? I don't know how many people saw those pictures of Kedarnath and other places where all these people who went there for uh, Tirth Yatra ended up littering the place completely. Clearly it shows that Hindus have forgotten the value of environment in their ecosystem itself, in their religious system itself. One of the things that we did I think uh, with a lot of foresight, was that we use Tirth Yatra as a way of connecting all parts of the country. So people from the south understand the concept of Jardham, 
and people from the north have to come to some place to the south so that there is no north-south divide. The existence or the emergence of a north-south divide, according to me, is a relatively recent phenomenon. It's not old at all. Second, most of these places which happen to be places of pilgrimage also happen to be in places where ecological balance is sensitive. So clearly there was an intent to protect the sanctity of those places by giving a religious fervor or flavor to the area itself, to the Kshetra itself. Imagine the deviation of the Hindu mind where it now sees them as purely religious places without the environmental significance. Ideally, I would say with certain huge population, not all of us must be going to Uttarakhand or to all these places. If left to me, I would certainly look at a permit system or a pass system. You can't go there on a regular basis. I don't know how many people have been to Shimla in the recent past, but from Delhi to Shimla when you go, we have destroyed mountains in, on the way to build four lane ways and six lane ways. I don't know what this is going to translate in the future. In the name of development, and people want four lane ways in Himalaya. I, I can understand having motorable roads for multiple reasons, but why do we need four lane ways and six lane ways? What is the point? So when we teach, let's say, Indic culture to this group, they love environment because they're being told in schools, Padaki Matkur, right? And they're also being uh, told about how to treat other genders and whatnot. Use the very same contentious issues to introduce them to our culture. This is the one culture where there are no cuss words for someone who does not have a binary gender identity. Those words don't come from us. And this is one gender or this one culture where Jeev and Jantu are expected to be treated at par with each other. Whether it's a sentient being or a non-sentient being, whether it's a thinking being or not, you have to respect it. Even trees have to be respected. That there was capital punishment for the felling of a tree needs to be told. That you cannot cut a tree off unless you can retrace it. Maybe those, those and, and I think the one thing that you're going to face with this generation is serious attention that's the disorder because of social media. So how to keep them bound and tied to one particular place and one particular issue, that's where I think the trick is. If that is achieved, I think after that it's an autopilot. Yes, next. Sir, what is the difference between educated and lawyer? Fantastic question. So uh, advocate is a technical term, lawyer is a general term. So I'll explain. Uh, Everybody who has an LLB is not a lawyer. You are a law graduate, you are not a lawyer. Because to be a lawyer, you have to register. Like doctors have licenses to practice, lawyers also have licenses to practice. So you have to register with the bar council. There is an act called the Advocates Act. So a law graduate who registers and has a license to practice as a lawyer is an advocate. So lawyer is a plain English term, advocate is a technical legal term. That's all there is to it. But for all practical purposes, both are interchangeable. Uh, usually when you say advocate, the mind immediately thinks of someone who wears the black coat and everything and who goes to court. But not all advocates do that, not all lawyers do that. People like me who are litigators, we do that. Some people, they draft contracts, they advise people. They are also lawyers. They are also advocates. I'll just confuse you. They are not litigators. <laughs> because we are the people who fight. So we are litigators. So lawyers who fight are litigators and advocates. Lawyers who don't fight, but who also practice in other ways, they are both lawyers and advocates, but not litigators. Have I confused you enough? <laughs> <laughs> Next. Uh, I have a question. Yes, I just joined, so I, I, I'm not fully aware of the context of the Q&A I just wanted to say that uh, Sai Deepak is Hyderabad's gift to India and the world. <laughs> I'm also from Himayat Nagar, not very far from where I've just studied. You've just patted your, yourself on the back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I wish I had known about this a little earlier. I came last evening. Uh, there is a quote uh, in, uh, about India which says that uh, the more things change in India, the, the more they remain the same. Right. Uh, it, it is an absolute pain. I mean, 
the Kashmir Pandit issue has been festering for the past 1990, 89, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, There has been, we thought there was a lot of movement, a lot of uh, progress, but the incidents of the last two, three months have shown that uh, there's a long way to go before we assure our own people Correct. Uh, that we, we, we not only talk, but we also walk the talk in terms of providing security and a sense, sense of reassurance for them. What, what can, in your view, be done uh, to ensure that uh, there is no there is no repeat of the violence and the hatred that we are seeing. So well, from a housekeeping perspective, just so that I am clear that I can answer, can I take this question in the session? No, I cannot. I mean, I <laughs> no, only because there are children here. That's why I want. Okay, fair enough. Then we can have it later. No, no, no problem. What do you want? Can I? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, in schools these days they are being taught. That all force is violence. All use of force is violence. We are producing a generation which does not know the distinction between violence and force, and genuine use of force and necessary use of force. That's a long term answer, but in terms of what can we do there, my criticism of the government has been that you think greater tourism means greater normalcy, which it is not. Because all it shows is a greater floating population, not a settler population. And tourists are a source of revenue for the people who will funnel it into anti-India activities again. So I would say the only way every part of Bharat can retain its dharmic nature as well as its peaceful nature is when at least 80% of each territorial unit populated by Tharas, whether it's the Northeast, whether it's Kerala, whether it's Bengal, or for that matter, Nivad, or Kashmir. The history of the subcontinent has been, whenever we are outnumbered, ultimately we will be kicked out. What was part of undivided part barely a, a century ago, or even 80 years ago, it's gone. Afghanistan is an example. Bangladesh is an example. A city that is dedicated to Dhakeshwari is now the capital of Bangladesh, Islamic Republic. So, my answer would be for a while, stop selling this mantra of Sarvadhamma Sapha. Come, he cut ties, and he has such a Doesn't work. I don't subscribe to the notion of one and I cannot be convinced otherwise. I have seen it firsthand. I have dealt with it firsthand. I come from a city and a family which has seen that mentality in action when Operation Polo was initiated. We have paid the price for it with blood. So I can never be convinced otherwise. I should have been seen as someone who comes from Bhaganagar, but I am seen as someone who comes from Hyderabad the land of the oasis. So therefore, you can chase peace as much as you want. But if you choose to do so without a sword hanging here, I think you're living in a fool's paradise. That's all I have to say. Next. Very simple question. Thank you. We're talking about history. You wrote a book on the journey that you want to suggest to this crowd. My initiation was Amatya Tilakam. And then gradually I moved to Rajagopal Chari's books on Raman and Mahabharata when I was in a position to understand what he was saying. Uh, uh, I benefited heavily and heavily from Archimedes. My entire initiation into public speaking and what it means to be a public speaker is through visualization of the majestic and divine voice of Swami Vivekananda when I read his speech. If at all I ever develop the ability, or if at all science gives you the ability to go back in time, perhaps I want to watch only two things. The Mahabharata War and Swami Vivekananda speak at Chicago. <laughs> every time I listen to him, or I, yes, I listen to him speak when I read him, it really sends shivers 
interesting. At a time when your deep beat buried under a colonial rule, a man who is walking into America specifically saying, I, I don't come from a slave race. I have taught you everything under the sun. And starts a line which effective and starts with a sentence that effectively exposes the parochiality of every thought process. Amazing, astounding. Absolutely. Imagine the kind of self-confidence and civilizational confidence it would have taken on his part to say this at that point as a dark man in a deeply racist America in the 1800s, in the late 1800s. Astounding. The credit obviously must go to his guru, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, because the belief is that his spirit effectively was speaking to this gentleman. And it's not as if he had a cakewalk. He was accused of everything under the sun by his own people. And he still sold it on. Amazing. So, if I could, I would hope that this generation reads Vivekananda with the fervor that I have read and with the spirit with which I have consumed him. And I hope they benefit from it. Yes? Last question. Yeah. Um, so, you mentioned uh, dharma, the concept of dharma. To many people, dharma is a practical way of life, teaching, austerity, etc. Right. But to many others, people, they just interpret dharma as spirituality. Right. What do you, in your opinion, a dharmic person, what is their way of living? So, dharma is neither. Dharma is actually uh, have you been a student of law or maybe a student of philosophy and just push you in the direction? But think and try something else. He's in class. So once you start hopefully taking up humanity, you'll come up you'll come across a particular theory of law called the natural theory of law. Or natural law of that Dharma in many ways is that. Because it basically says whatever keeps balance in the society and in the universe is dharma. Whatever sustains, let's say, the cosmological balance, so to speak, is that. Which is why you don't look, up, look at it as just religion. You think of it as the right course of action in a particular situation that yields the most optimal outcome in preserving that balance, that harmony in nature and in society. But when I put it this way, it's almost as if it's philosophy floating at 60,000 feet. So you need to make it more practical. So then you have its interpretations and so on and so forth. I'll give you a simple example. You're a student of mathematics, at the very least. You've done basic maths in school, yes. right? You don't know how to make equations now. You're taught how to apply equations in mathematics. If you become a student of mathematics, slowly what you'll be expected to do is to understand the logic behind it so that you can create your own equations. So think of dharma as the basic pure science of creating these equations. And think of its application on a day-to-day -day basis as you just knowing how to apply it. So think of it as basic science versus applied science. So dharma is so esoteric and so full of possibilities that the word religion does not do justice to it at all. Because religion is downright saying this is the way to do it. The why cannot be answered at all. It can't be questioned at all. It's a rule book. Dharma is not a rule book. Dharma gives you the outcome, which is to say this is what you should be hopefully reaching. How you choose to go over to tell you with you. Which is why the definition and application of dharma will change from situation to situation because it depends on the circumstances. So like adding to this, when you said balance, what do you exactly mean by preserving that balance? Okay. Uh, think of dharma as the traffic signal. If the traffic signal dictates every twist and turn that you're supposed to take, then you will not be able to drive. But if you were allowed to drive in a manner that you want, and there is no traffic signal at all, effectively it's going to create chaos. So dharma, think of it as something that creates a balance between your right to drive and your duty to respect others' rights to drive and be safe. So think of dharma as that guiding light. Next. Oh, thank you. Thank you.
Now I would request uh, Shri Shobhit Mathur and Mrs. Uh, Sombra Dewar to present uh, what kind of shock is found to Sai Deepakji as a token of gratitude.